super. Hallo. Um, English. So, I am super thrilled to announce our next two speakers. Um, and I will start with uh, Julia Wissert, with her biography, with Anta Helena Reckes' uh, biography. And the concept of this dialogue is actually that I will just uh, lean back and these two are going to talk to each other. And they will also um, contextualize this talking to each other in their conversation. So Julia Wissert studied directing at the University Mozarteum Salzburg as well as drama with media arts at the University of Surrey. She worked as assistant director in different cities and state theaters in Germany. Her first work experience outside the institution was in Salzburg when she developed the performance Salzburger Death Dance, for which she received the prize of the city of Salzburg. Her diploma thesis was an artistic investigation into structural racism on German-speaking stages called Schwarz macht weiß, Black Power White, a critical analysis of the work conditions of black theater makers and German-speaking stages. This is also part of the German Namibian artist collective Kaleni, a space for collaboration and exchange. Anta Helena Recke was born and grew up in Munich. She worked at the Berlin Grips Theater in the field of theater and education before starting drama studies at the University of Hildesheim in 2011, from 2015 to 16 to the, to the 2016 and 17 season. She was a permanent director's assistant at the Münchner Kammerspiele. Her works, her works conceptual art, in the form of theatrical performance, and I think she will speak to that as well, deal with the marking and non-repetition of normativity and the question of how to construct a spatial experience for the audience that it would not otherwise enter. In the current season at the Münchner Kammerspiele, Anta will redirect the play Mittelreich in the style of appropriation art with a cast of black actors, which, which was originally staged by Anna-Sophie Mahler and invited to the Berlin Theatertreffen in 2016. Thank you so much for being here, and now I would like to ask you to come up to the podium. Hi, Anta. Hi. <laughs> so, first of all, thank you, Nana, for inviting us to this talk. I think now the mic. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, I actually want to, first of all, say how Anta and I met, because Anta and I actually never met before. Um, we were. <laughs> Which, well, we ran into each other in a theater once and we were like, ah, you're Anta and you're Julia, and then we went our separate ways. But this is actually the first time that we spend time with each other and have a conversation with each other about our work. And we had to laugh a little when you spoke with you about your relationship with Julia, because it was very similar. We had been in WhatsApp and email and Skype contact but this is the first time that we have a chance to actually speak to each other and with each other. So, do you want yeah, it, to say it, why yeah. we actually been like, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the same phenomena, phenomena um, or a similar phenomena because we are both um, working in a theater and we are both not white. So apparently everyone who heard of uh, the two of us um, tells us that we need to meet, you, meet each other and that uh, obviously we, are, we must do the same thing, uh, more or less. And, um, and it's a very, for me, it's a very schizophrenic um, thing because on the one hand, it's true that we should meet each other and that I also have the desire to meet every other black German artist that is around, in a way. But on the other hand, the, the, the motivation of people telling us that we, that we need to meet each other is, uh, is tricky too, because um, it obviously has to do uh, with a lot of 
projection and a lot of um, making us the same just because we're not white and um, yeah. It's interesting because when I first heard um, when I first heard that oh you have to meet Anta, I was intrigued and at the same time I was an annoyed because um, I worked in very classical traditional contexts and um, I was fascinated by what I heard of and about you, but on the other hand I was also annoyed to that point that I said to everyone at one point, well, if you're a white director, then maybe you should meet these other white directors because it referred to this, I felt it made something visible, which is one of the problems which I think both of us work or tackle in our work in a way, this, this idea that there's, um, there's these two or three white, uh, black people and they all do the same art and they all have the same topic and they all work in the same way. And I read about you, which I found very interesting, that you work on whiteness. Do you maybe want to say something to that? <laughs> what does that mean, work on whiteness? Um, yeah, it, it's very hard to say, uh, to, uh, like, to find out what that means and I try to find it out each and every time I do a, no, a new project, but I try to elaborate on it maybe by explaining um, my re most recent piece that is um, also the biggest one that I've made so far. Because I think most of the people here are not from the theater context and might not know anything about it. So it's, um, what I did, I copied uh, an existing piece that was staged um, in a, in a traditional uh, state theater in Munich, on the biggest stage there, and that was based on a novel um, that talks about uh, German history after World War II um, by, by telling us the story of a, of, a, of a family in a small Bavarian village. So I copied that piece completely, so I did everything uh, in the same way, the stage design, the costume, the text, the timing, but I exchanged the all white cast for a black one. And um, sometimes it's very hard to explain to friends that are not German how that is actually a concept. So why is that something that becomes uh, a thing that you, that you, so, but I think it's, it's, it's a good way of entering the German discourse if you don't know it, because it shows um, how strong the um, illusion of a, of a white German identity uh, is. Um, that it's not, so, it's not so easy to tell it from just watching the piece, but if you watch everything that evolves around it, so the collateral damage that staging the piece does in all kinds of uh, forums like newspapers, TV appearances, conversations, the whole discourse, discussions about it. There you can really find out about where we stand uh, right now in a, in, a, in, a, in a critical discourse in Germany, in a way. At least that is what I tried to do. So um, it was very hard for me to explain to, re re to the press, for example, that it's not a piece that is about blackness or about black actors or about, uh, yeah, but that it's a piece about whiteness and that I uh, like try to do uh, this exaggeration of, a, of an all white German historical narrative in order to, to make it more uh, experienceable that having an all-white cast telling an historical German story is also an exaggeration and, uh, and um, an illusion, yeah, in a way. It was interesting because afterwards I, um, I was approached by a dramaturg who I'll be working with in a couple of years, and he said he saw the piece, and it was this strange experience because he saw black people speaking these German texts and pretending to be Germans and it was a, it was, a, <laughs> I know, I know. It was this really weird moment because I sat there going, well, 
to me, black and Germanness isn't really that crazy. So when I saw it, I was like, okay. Like, it was really interesting that the reaction was so strong by the white audience and also the conversation now about it, I feel is very, shows it even deeper or makes this problem even more obvious because he didn't understand when I said, well, being black and German at the same time does exist and also not, and that it me that it just reality and not like, it was very a strange moment. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, there are two very dominant um, ways of uh, perception with the piece. So the first one is that people are being very busy um, taking room um, in order to explain how um, this piece doesn't provoke them, you know, and um, how it's not irritating to them at all. And um, that therefore it's it's pointless. Uh, so this shows already that mm -hmm. the the implication that um, staging black Germanness is uh, is automatically read as a, as a, as something me meant to be a provocation or um, a problem. Um, but I never said that. Uh, mm. it, and the second um, the second dominant thing is that. Um, it's perceived through the lens of um, comparing. So um, it's all about uh, were they able to produce this professional uh, theater piece and are they as good or are they worse and can they handle uh, singing classical music and uh, like most of the people decided that they can't. And, um, and every review except one um, has at least one paragraph that deals with the question whether this is a professional theater production or not. You know, in a go like in a positive or in a negative way, but it was something that had to be discussed in the first place. And, mm -hmm. and like, like I said, like we, can, we can get out, of, uh, get out a lot of things about how, how um, perception works in the so-called German intelligentsia, as soon as uh, a non-white, non-male uh, um, expression is done in a in a in a in the center, mm. because if I had made a piece with an all-black cast um, about black topics or about migration or about something that is not um, um, reclaiming a, a, a prominent uh, holy space, um, it would it, it wouldn't be worth talking about it. No, uh, yeah. Interesting. I was intrigued by this idea of working on whiteness because when I read it or heard it, I can't remember. Um, I had to think about it because. I would say that in my approach to theater or performative arts, I'd say that I would work on blackness, whatever that means. But um, in a sense of, I was very happy about Mittelreich because I thought, oh nice, now I can actually work. <laughs> you know, it's like, ah, now I don't have to put myself in relation to whiteness in order to work because Anta did that and Anta like, gave me this um, jumping off point and now I can just do texts and, and things and people and the performers I work with are of color and black and they are just people or aliens or whatever they want to be because there is this new idea of the of the POC body being a reality, like be the POC body on a German speaking stage is just an offer to, to tell stories or to investigate certain narratives. However, um, I was maybe too, still too. Optimistic. <laughs> yeah, maybe too optimistic because it's still, um, when I, uh, when I started negotiating for the next two seasons, everyone is, um, I was also involved in trying to, um, to cast an ensemble for theater. And um, there were a lot of POC performers coming in and 
it was amazing and I got to work with them and it was like, yeah, blah, 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 great, so we can hire them, but there's still this idea, but how are we going to cast them? What are they going to play? Because it's like, and I thought, now that you did this, we can move past it, but still there's this idea of the POC body still and always being this body and nothing else. There's no possibility of a transformation. And in my approach, I thought that I did, I investigated this for quite a long time and then I came to the point where I thought I cannot fight anymore and I can't have these arguments anymore. So I, I started to think about what would be a, a strategy to actually subvert this. And now the strategy I'm using or I'm trying to implement is that I don't speak about the realities I want to create, but rather I cast a team around me which defies certain expectations, but we never speak about it. Mm -hmm. So we never say um, we work together because we have this experience of being marginalized in a German speaking context, blah, blah, blah. This is why we work together, but rather um, we come together as artists and we want to create together and we want to tell these stories together. And so when I saw the whiteness thing, I was wondering if that already means working on blackness without actually speaking about it. And then at the same time, I was wondering, why am I not allowed to speak about it? Because then it, like, it gets hijacked, like you said. Then it has to be about refugees and why is this body on a stage and why is this body blah, blah, blah. So... I don't know, my experience with that strategy is that um, you are, actually you, the possibility to define yourself um, is not really there. So you can come together and not make blackness uh, or migration a topic, but people will write about it mm -hmm. like that and see it like that anyway. Yeah. And it's really... Um, it's it's very tricky, and that's why I, yeah. that's why I, I'm 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 much slower than you. I don't. I think it's not possible to even think about like the next step, like what 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 how could we work if, if like the racist structure um, were something that we could actually talk about mm. or. Uh, that we could acknowledge as existent or something, because we are really not there. And so I, I work about like, how can I make it even a thing? Like how can I even uh, get into the perception itself and, um, and, and somehow like make color blindness in, in the, in the, in, the, in the referential system of a stage and it's the symbols moving in there, how can I like disrupt it? Because I think this is really all I can do right now because everything else would be like three steps ahead and, and I think it's a repetition of what already is and what has always been because the audience can read it in their white um, illusion gaze anyway, because, I, yeah. But I like what Julia yeah. said. I like what Julia yeah. said when she said um, she creates scenes which are mind games and objects which are mind games. And I wonder, is it possible to create performative art and I completely agree with you where I love when people say, oh, we're in this post-racial society and you look at a white person claiming this and you think, obviously, we're not. Like, obviously, we're far away from that. Like, and it's, it's, we experience it every day. And I assume that your experience is very similar, especially in Munich. Um, but I still wonder, is it possible to just to seduce an audience, you know, to, to give clues and to codify a performance in a way that you know what I'm talking about because you know the referencing system that I use. And you can see the certain things, um, like Melissa said, you can see the black body even though the black body isn't present. And I wonder if that strategy can work on a on a, on a German speaking stage so that if you come from that kind of audience you were speaking about, 
then they'll see a interesting or entertaining or curious theater evening and then they'll say, oh, it didn't provoke me because nothing happened to me. I didn't, it wasn't for me. But if, if you're not white, you will get a chance to actually see like an experience which isn't spoken about in that kind of context. And it's like, it's a super privileged, super well-funded context. And I always think, why should, I not be represented? Why should my narrative not be told? Or why should, why should my socialization or the experiences that I had not be spoken about just because everyone says, well, how can I relate to a black body? Which is the worst thing I could possibly hear. But, and I totally agree. It's um, maybe, and I, I totally agree with what you say. And this is why I think it only works in relation to what you do. It's not faster. I'm just actually yeah. trying to ride on your wave and like yeah. go, you know, to, to work. What is the next step? What is the next thing that would, could happen? Or what would be the ideal, amazing, most positive thing to do? Which is... Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, like that we're now talking more about the audiences because also, there's another uh, black female theater maker uh, in Germany that is called uh, Simone Dede Ayivi. And um, like, I, I say it like this because we, all, like, we three are very often like our names are being dropped together. Uh, and, Olivia. and Olivia Wenzel, who's a who writer. And yeah. Can I just quickly say, yeah. and with Olivia, it actually happened the other day that someone came up to me and said, hey, congratulations to your new text. Yeah. I'm, I'm like, it, it literally happens to me at least once a month that people address me as, hey, Olivia, how have you been? It, it, it's really like, yeah. yeah, but what, like we, we even went to the same university and um, it happens there with our professors and, but whatever. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say is that because Simone's approach is, since a couple of years, as far as I understand it, um, she asks herself the question, what happens to my, to my uh, work if I stop imagining white audiences, but audiences of color? And um, it is very interesting because um, I didn't do that, but because luckily, and I'm so happy, so incredibly happy about it, the piece that I did um, actually had the effect that um, the audience was much more diverse than I had seen ever before in this theater where I worked for two years, more or less. Um, I started to think about the question and also about, because um, audiences of color, they perceive the piece completely different, obviously, than, than white audience members. And they have, for them, it has a completely different meaning. And it's, um, it's not a heady, conceptual um, thing. It's more, it's just spectacular. It's just like spectacular in an overwhelming way because they make the experience of going one of this, into one of these holy palaces of a national identity and actually not, not, uh, and they are not the only person of color in there. Only that, even before they enter the space where the performance actually happens, you know. And these kind of um, <clears throat> stagings that happen around the staging of the actual piece are so important to me. And, um, and it's also interesting that in the discourse about the piece, in the public discussions, in discussions like that even, um, we only ever talk about um, the experience of the white audience, but we never talk about what it is to non-white spectators because it's a completely different thing. But somehow it's also, unless you do a lot of um, exhausting explanation work, it's almost impossible to, um, to, exp to, to, give, to give a white audience a glimpse into what it, what it is to look at a piece as a non-white person because you live in different worlds, like you don't, you see completely different things when you look into this space of symbolism, no? And yeah, that's also um, to come back to what you said earlier about uh, Julia's work and how the black body is present in it without being there. 
Mm, I find it hard to transfer this um, into performative arts because the body, the actual body, is, is really the center of it. And the body on stage is a symbol and the black body on stage is a completely different symbol than the white body on stage. You, you cannot change that for now. It's like, it's, uh, I think, I, the only thing I can do is like to, to make, to try to make it become thematical, is that a word? Yeah, um, thematical, how they are different symbols and why. Yeah. Please don't get me wrong. It's not about it's not about the black body not being on stage. Obviously, it's the center of the performance. But rather, I wonder. This is why, for example, I'm very intrigued by artistic collaboration as form of political resistance. This is why we came up with, um, with the collective because I went to Namibia for the first time after having seen three performances which dealt with German colonialism and in <laughs> <laughs> We both laugh because, um, <laughs> because uh, from it's in my embarrassing. It's it's sad and, and embarrassing. painful and horrible yeah. because it's it's it claims to be universal and for universal audiences. But when you're black, you sit in the audience and you have to be exposed to a reproduction of racist stereotypes and racist language. Because if it's about racism and colonialism, we have to produce reproduce this shit in order for people to understand that it's shit. So after the third piece I saw, I was. Or just because we have to protect artistic freedom. Oh, yes, artistic freedom. It's always artistic freedom. Yeah, that's right. Um, and after the third piece I saw, I, after two and a half minutes, there were two and a half black people in the audience, half because there was a, a baby present as well. So it's a person, but like a little person. I felt that I'm, I'm, I'm again exposed to violence against black bodies, and I left the audience... Um, Wondering how could I, as the, as the representation of the colonizer and the colonized at the same time in the same body work about colonization without reproducing that kind of violence? And so I thought it would be a good idea to actually go to the place where colonization, German colonization uh, happened. Um, and so I ended up in Namibia and wanted to have conversations with other artists about their work and how they, how German colonization influences their practice. And through that conversation, um, this sort of collaboration started and we came to that point where we realized that we actually don't want to work about colonization because we rather just work with each other. And this is, this is I think, what I mean with the, the reference frame would be probably readable to you as well as any other German or, or any, or my hope would be for the work that it would be readable for someone um, who is of color or, or black. And, and I found it interesting that we, we created this, this collective in order to resist together. And I found it very, this is why it was great, or it's great to meet you, because this kind of networks and alliances are important to survive, because I don't know about you, but every, I think, three times a day, I think I want to leave Germany so desperately, and we spoke about this um, earlier with Ant about um, Julia and Nana, that there seems to be a generation of artists, or generation would be too big a word, but women before us who actually did leave and now we are here sort of mutilating ourselves in order to fight the good fight. And how do you protect yourself? How do you survive? It's, and do you have that question also? Uh, yes, of course. Like I, um, yeah, because obviously um, there's so much extra work in just getting a little bit closer um, to a framework in which your work is read that is the framework that you actually set for it because it's there's 
people are very, very poorly educated in Germany about a, a particular um, kind of knowledge, no, like really incredibly, yeah, how can I, it's until maybe two years ago, you couldn't even call a white person white in Germany without having the whole conversation only about that. You know, it, I just try to make you understand like why it's so obvious that black German artists don't work in Germany. And, but um, yeah, I, I, I've lost track a bit, but um, yeah, it is, it is, it is a I question go? for me. Yeah, should I stay or should I go? And um, especially with the, with the Rechtsruck, like the right wing um, strongness of the last, last two years and the really, um, you can really feel this, the change in public space as well. You know, it, it, it gets shittier and shittier really. And not only the public space with the so-called um, like working class people, but also the, the academic space and the, uh, um, the universe, yeah, the artistic, uh, the artistic space, which is basically the same, <laughs> more or less. Um, but yeah, and but why strangely, do hmm? why do you stay? Because strangely, um, by exploring the question of uh, do I have to leave, um, I also stumble around this um, Heimat begriff. Um, Heimat, um, how can you translate it? It's home, home? yeah, homeland. homeland, and it's a very like prominent Kampfbegriff um, um, <laughs> for uh, within this right wing discourse uh, that takes place within the, uh, that took place in the last two years, and it's but it's also um, it becomes very dominant for me uh, because this is the only context that I know as precisely as I know it. Um, and it's the only language in which I can express myself as precisely, and it's very important to me to express myself precisely. And also, um, like Nana, you were talking about this um, responsibility as a citizen and whether we should take this conference to the street. And, and I, I, I really have a strong feeling for that. I think that if we leave there, it's, it is really also um, a sign of, of, of hopelessness in a way, because I really don't know who else could do the work that really should be done. I wish I, I wasn't in a position, but that's just the fact. I mean, white people who don't even know that they're white are not going to do the work. You know, it's, it's <laughs> um, yeah, but I want to leave all the time and I do leave a lot as well. And I, and it's also interesting that um, you talk about your experience in Namibia because I've been there for the first time as well this year. And again, of course, I also um, ended up um, um, saying, my, telling myself, I don't, I'm actually, I'm really not interested in making a, a theater piece about German colonialism, and which is basically a history lesson that should be done in school, but isn't. Um, and, but what I found very interesting there is how, um, the meeting of the, the strange, unworldly Germanness of the so-called Namibian Germans and my strange, unworldly Germanness, and how we are both living uh, an extraordinary uh, variation of Germanness and um, how that is like contextualized within history. And, and I'm very interested in, in uh, finding out about those two Germannesses meeting. So again, I, I travel to Namibia and I want to be like in black context and I want to, and somehow I also like, I, at some point I just need to go there because I'm a black German, I don't know why, but I do. 
And then in the end, again, I end up wanting to work about Germanness, you know? Um, yeah. Sollen wir öffnen? Yes. Oder wollen wir... Ja, why not? Shall we open the conversation or shall we continue conversing? No, I'm sure are there any questions to the things we said, which are so clear and <laughs> unproblematic because there's no structural racism? Um, I have a question. So you can think about yours in the oh, meantime. Nana, may I, may I ask you another question? Yes, of course. Because what, I wonder what it is. What is Germanness? <laughs> because it pisses me off because where I come from, like this has nothing to do with this Germanness. I come from a part of Germany which is basically French and Swiss and people eat melted cheese and the language is completely different and they don't drink beer, they drink wine and I'm always... I'm always surprised with the right-wing movement is being able to, to claim that there's a German narrative because I wonder what is this German narrative because the country is so young and there is no one thing, there is no one German reality. And what you described with the German Namibians, um, when I experienced a few of them, I felt I went to a time, into a time machine into 1948 where white people were allowed to beat their children and the language is very old and the, the mindset is like 1948 and, and I'm confronted with these, with these constructions of a national narrative and identity and the way that, that I would approach it or I'm interested in approaching it is by working on the AfD list of German plays there was this list of German, the, the right-wing party published a list of right German um, narratives which should be put on German stages. And my approach to that, because I was asked what I wanted to direct, I told the dramaturg that they can, that we should look at this list and see what exactly is Germanness. And then I want to do an interpretation of this idea of Germanness with, with my team and um, the, the, the performers that I work with because it would very quickly... It's super cool. Because it becomes very yes. quickly very clear that what, what is it? I don't know. It's like... Yeah, I'm, I'm your German. I don't. Yeah, and you're totally right. Obviously, there is no Germanness. Like, and it's also a bit... As you say that, I realize it's it's very. Actually, I I, I don't want no to uh, like operate um, with concepts of of nations, like because mm -hmm. they are shit. But um, again, I think it's a it's it's a it's a step that has to be done, like before yeah. we can even come to a place where we say, okay, what about this concept of nations and borders and but then we do the should. evening together. Yeah. Then you do yeah. the first part and I do the second yeah. part. It's like <laughs> Germanness and then the interpretation yeah. of Germanness. Yeah. Sorry, that was the question. Oh, that was a great that was a great, great question. Um I there is a question over there. I know that thank you for uh letting me ask my question first, Nana, because it relates so much to what was just said. Um, I um, followed through the different um, press articles around your piece, Mittelreich. I had, from the beginning, uh, I was really interested in the discourses which, you know, the public created around it. Around it. Um, I didn't have the chance to see the piece before the theater treffen, like I saw it last week. And I haven't seen the white, like the original white edition of your colleague from the uh, Kammerspiele in M Munich. And I also haven't read the original novel of Josef Bierbichler. And uh, so I'm merely speculating now, but I want to reflect together with you on this notion of Germanness, because when I saw your piece last week, I thought, Thank God I haven't seen this in the white edition, like the white cast, <laughs> because I thought I would have left the theater 
because I think the material you, cho you chose to work with is so heavy and really, I mean, I, as I said, I haven't read the novel, but I imagine it to be a reactionary piece of work, like a very much a Heimat roman. So this is my association. And it was like, just the script was getting on my nerves. You know, mm. it was so annoying. <laughs> So I thought what you actually did was you rescued the piece, you know, you rescued the material from being complete crap, like really low, low level Germanists, yeah, mm -hmm. constructions of Germanists. And then I, this reminded me of a conversation I had with Peggy, which we heard yesterday, Peggy Piesche, we did a workshop together and in this workshop she said at one point, you know, you, like white Germans, recently, especially left-wing people, intel intelligentsia, starts to leave us alone, us black Germans alone, with the notion of Germanness. The only people who still, you know, work on this are we. Do you understand what I mean? Ihr überlasst mm. uns, ihr überlasst uns schwarzen Deutschen, das Deutschsein, mit dem ihr nichts mehr zu tun habt. Mm -hmm. You don't want to deal with Germanness, mm -hmm. like you white, mm -hmm. left-wing, anti-racist, white conscious people, you reject the notion of Germanness and leave it up to us to do something with it. And I found that a very interesting mm -hmm. thought. I don't know if I explain myself. And when I saw your piece, I thought, yeah, this is exactly what, I mean, Peggy's not here unfortunately now, but I texted to her like, I'm just watching this piece and I think I understand perfectly what you mean because what I see here wouldn't be bearable. But if, was it not staged, like was it not a black cast? Yeah, it's, I think I, I see what she means because in the, in the German left, there's also a kind of colorblindness. I mean, they know all the, all the um, how do you say, punchlines about anti-racist thinking or something, but, um, but a lot of people think they are automatically beyond it because they are activists or something. And then it falls under the table and, and yeah, and I mean, you see so many theater makers who say, oh yeah, that's so cool what you did in Genius and da da da. But if they only ever have any performer of color on stage, it's when they talk about uh, the refugee crisis or, uh, yeah, no, only that actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I think she's right, and and um, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's maybe maybe that's a good moment. Hello, hello. Maybe that's a good moment for uh, for me to ask my question because um, whilst listening to you, I was thinking about your education. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about the obstacles that you may have um, encountered. Anta, you mentioned being mistaken for another black person in the school. I mean, that's like the micro level, right? But then when we think about the macro in terms of the um, curriculum and what one is exposed to at universities, whether you are studying theater or if you are studying um, comparative literature. Yesterday, when I was in conversation with Peggy, she pointed so beautifully out um, how um, how racist Schiller, for instance, like the wonderful, great Schiller that we all had to, who are socialized in Germany, read in school, um, analyze over weeks, and you know, who is also um, a, a writer who was. Um, yeah, part of the German theater canon. You will find in every theater, I think right now, at least six Schiller plays in Germany, at least, right? Um, so I'm, I wanted to point out, or actually I want to hear a little bit about that kind of where did you, because you did the work, you did the extra work, right? Like you educated yourself, but that did not, did not necessarily happen in school, I suppose. How did that come about? And, um, and then I asked something else. I think the first time I realized that 
something was wrong was actually when I was in kindergarten and there was a play being put on, the Der Wolf und die Sieben Geißlein, The Wolf and the Seven Goat Babies. I don't know the word, like baby goats. Kids. And the wolf uh, knocks on the house, and then he eats the babies, and then the mother comes, cuts him open, takes out the babies, puts him full of, uh, makes him full of stones, and throws him into the well. No idea why I, uh, but it was a performance, and I knew that I had to be one of the goats. I knew it. I was ready. I was ready to play that role. I was like... Um, and um, I wasn't allowed to because of the costumes, because the lady said that the costumes are white costumes and um, it wouldn't go with my skin color. And there wasn't really a conscious moment where I thought, oh, that's very racist, but I knew something happened to my body. I knew that like, there's this moment of like, shock which goes through your body. And through that, I learned very quickly to every time, or I think that, This helped to, every time I wake up, I put on a suit of armor and I go out into the world because I'm used to being exposed to that kind of microaggressions and uh, racist insults. Maybe sometimes it's not even micro, sometimes it's small, um, a bit bigger. Uh, but I think um, the moment, there were certain moments when, these, when my armor was challenged because, for example, when I was in Harlem for the first time, I took um, a, a tube to Harlem from Manhattan, I think, somewhere, and it, uh, it became from white, the, like white, just a white tube to more people of color, and then it became very black. And I was standing in the, in the subway thinking, I would, why, is, why are these men looking at me? And I kept turning around thinking, like, who are they looking at? Until I realized that like, people were just looking at me and smiling, and there was just like, nothing. It was just because people were smiling, but I, I, I realized that I'm so used to a certain gaze and a certain expectation onto my body that I'm not used to being just, and it wasn't just men, but people um, looking at me. But what I wanted to say is that I think through these little moments, when you get a, a chance to see there's another world, you come back home and you cannot, you cannot perform whiteness anymore. You, you go out and like my safe haven, for example, is Johannesburg. When I went to Johannesburg for the first time, it was like, <laughs> I, was, I didn't even know what happened to me. I came back with a suitcase full of books and like contacts and artist contacts because I was so invigorated by this. And then I landed in Germany, and within two months, it was this again. But I think this constant going out and coming back helps to, to continue the education and also to continue the, the discussion. Um, but in university, when I wrote my thesis, for example, I didn't want to finish it because it was horrible. I had a... I had a teacher, and I didn't, in the first place I didn't want to write it, and I only wrote it because of Körber Studio. It's, um, it's a directing um, festival for young directors, and every school sends one person to Körber Studio, and I did an Ibsen play, and afterwards everyone said, oh, Julia Visser, she should go to Maxim Gorky Theater, <laughs> which is, Maxim Gorky Theater is a theater which works on post-migrant perspectives, so, um, emphasizes uh, POC narratives, black narratives, and I didn't understand how me directing Ibsen would lead to everyone assuming that I should go to Maxim Gorky Theater, and I was just denied to be a director and just be this very specific director. And after that experience, I thought, maybe there are other people who are experiencing similar things in this kind of institution, and... Um, I started the research and it was great to again meet people and exchange and see I'm not crazy, I'm not the only one who thinks something is wrong. But at the same time, um, I was told off so many times by the university because of quotes that I used in the text. There was a quote by Johann Simons, who is a very famous director, the head of the theater uh, you worked at before Matthias Lilienthal. And he said in an interview in Austria that as a child he had a piggy bank, which was a black 
boy. There must have been this piggy bank in the 60s or 70s, which was very famous, which was a black person with a cut on the head. And every time he walked past it, he put money in it, and he knew that he would bring culture to black people. And I used that quote in, um, to make a reference that this kind of person is now the head of many theaters in Europe and that this kind of thinking doesn't just disappear because you say, I'm not, I don't want to perpetuate this kind of thinking anymore. It's the same. Like, there's this one black um, actor who sometimes plays at the former Volksbühne in Berlin and someone who um, attended, like, the goodbye speech of Frank Kastorf in, at the Volksbühne said his last sentence was, he was, like, talking from here to the, this, this black actor in the audience and he said, yeah, and then I hope one day you call me and say, let's go to Africa. It, And I don't even know what that means, but <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what does that mean? No, but, but this guy is really, and he did this like piece that was also in Theatertreffen, and it's like the piece about post-colonialism because he, um, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I didn't even see it, but I can imagine it, you know, after having heard this, and it's, um, now he's the one putting post-colonialism in, in the German canon on the map. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, yeah he, okay. kind of, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, I have, um, I don't know if it's a question, I think it's more of a comment because there is, um, I know that, you know, kind of in the university periphery, there's also a lot of work done to what Peggy and I talked yesterday about in terms of the hidden histories or the hid histories of black performativity. Uh, in Peggy's case, it was a different context. It was literature, and we talked about, um, oh yeah, um, activism, 1968, and we talked about a lot of things. Um, but I, there's, uh, in the periphery, also in theater studies, a lot of work done, like for instance, Azade Sharifi, who's looking at um, the history of the Wiener Festspiele. She did mm. um, archival research there in order to emphasize that black performance was part, I mean, we're talking about the Austrian context now there, but that uh, someone like James Baldwin um, actually staged uh, a play there. There were um, black actors involved and she would only find like these little photographs, etc. And in order to reconstruct and to really create uh, a, f a full embodied history of, um, of, of theater in, in this, in Vienna, but I know that she's doing very similar things also in, um, in Germany. And then there's another, um, but also interestingly, another black researcher, you now leaving the Germanness to the black people um, here, who um, is doing the same work on opera. Um, Beate? Mm -hmm. Beate? Oh no, then you know another one. I'm blanking right now about the person's um, name. It's, it's been a while um, that I've met them. Joy? No, yeah. it's. No. No, um, it's. Um, he... Lara? No, I know exactly how that person looks like, but I, yeah, me too. Yeah. I'm blanking. Okay. I just I wanted to point phone. out that there is a lot of work done. Yeah. Ah, yes. 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 Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. So, yes, I just wanted to say that there is, you know, like, there's a lot of work, it just doesn't find that kind of recognition. Because, and, yeah. sorry to interrupt, because it, it's the cast off phenomenon. Like, like the thing, um, it, it, it's this thing where I'm always flabbergasted because you're standing in the corner going, hey, there's a topic, hello, can we work on it? And then a white dude comes along, just does a text, and then everyone is like, finally, Finally, we can speak about post-colonialism. And you're like, uh, <laughs> it's this, because there's this, in Germany, this thing happening, in my opinion, where everyone is turning to the African continent looking for artists who can finally speak about black identity. And it, this, I, these identities are being uh, gleichgesetzt. Like I said, 
as equal. Set as equal to black European experiences. And so you just have to take artists from Johannesburg, Cape Town, Dakar, take them to Germany. They create amazing art. And it's, we've, we've spoken about it. But that this kind of experience might also differ. And it's also, even in the case of African artists or black American artists coming to Europe and uh, like representing post-colonial discourse or something, it's, it's different from when Frank Kastorf does it because as soon as a non-white person works about it or talks about it, they talk about it as a betroffener. So what is a betroffener in English? Uh, if, an, an affected, affected one, or like, and you can't get out of it. It's like, and but if Frank Kastorf talks about it, he just made a point that it's an important issue we have to talk about, you know. And then it's also in the reception of my piece. Like, I spent with, I spent two hours with a journalist, really, really trying to explain to them what structural racism is and how my piece is not personal at all because it's about structural racism and whiteness. In the end, they still ask the question, what is your personal experience with racism? And it's the only thing that remains from the interview. And it happens, like, all the time. And, yeah. Do you experience racism in Germany? <laughs> how does it feel? <laughs> what is it like? <laughs> But you're, you're not really black. You're just, like... How are we even supposed to call these people on stage? Because they are not that black, aren't they? You know, uh, this kind of... Like, But you can't, you can't say anything anymore because there's this political correctness and anything we say is wrong. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> We're uh, ranting. It was just that I was thinking of the question and you kind of mentioned something that I feel like I wanted to ask. I know a huge problem in the UK with performance work and theatre work is that even when we get the collective and make the work, uh, the reviewers are still white. Mm -hmm. And so what we've started to try and do is How do we cross over disciplines to make sure that it's not just about black folk making the theater, we then have black folk coming to see it, and then black folk reviewing it, and then black, then you're coordinating with black critics. I just wondered if, what's the conversation like here, or, or have you had your reviewed work reviewed by black folk? How did that feel for you? Uh, how can you imagine ways that it could continue? Um, yeah, there are actually two um, reviews uh, written by people of color, and one just uh, from last week. Um, and I think, like, we are on our way. Like, it's, I have a strong feeling about that in the last two years, like, there is this, like, this thing, like, that is positive and negative at the same time, that uh, we, are, we are connecting us and we, we know about each other because we, we are confronted with each other all the time, even if we don't meet. And also, um, there's, like, slowly um, the understanding of um, having to break out of the isolation of being in an only white environment and also, like, seeing yourself uh, from that perspective. Um, I think because the, the, the theory um, matching this uh, understanding like now is present enough to, to have this effect on, on a lot of people and so that we realize it's, it's, it's systematical and it's good to systematically know each other in a way. And, but we are only starting it. Um, I think we're only starting it. Like for example, us meeting for the first time now in front of you. Yeah. It's like a non -so, not so blind date. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for courageously sharing all of these experiences. I, I guess my question is, what type of ally in Germany you know, do you envision helping? You know, it, I mean, obviously you're very talented and you're very skilled and you, you can do the work on your own, but it seems like you, Yeah, so what kind of ally would you like? Because I don't think that you guys should carry all this. It's just, oh, anyway. Like, how do with, you invite, yeah. With what, me? What would, an ally, what, would, what would an ally for you be in terms of your artistic and institutional um, desires? I don't, I don't know how to put the question. No. I sometimes, like, 
I got an email the other day from a theater who wants to work with me in the future and they, they spoke about something, blah, blah, blah. And then they said, and they also had this great idea for a youth project, topic Pocahontas. Mm. So I spent days and days and days to speak with them about certain things and they are one of the, I thought, good ones. And when I saw that email, I felt, I just said, thanks for the email and didn't say anything to that anymore. And I feel that institution-wise, um, also what you asked earlier, I think um, there needs to be, I am all about sanctions and change in funding. Um, I don't think you should just get 25 million euros because you're an institution. I think you should, it should be more similar to how it works in England. You have to legitimize and uh, tra be transparent why you're doing the art the way you, why you're creating the way you're creating with the artists you're creating with, and who is the, who are the people who are working in your institution, and um, there should I in my case, it would be amazing if other people could actually contextualize what I am doing because it's difficult for me to do because I cannot speak about it because I don't want the institution to know what I'm doing because it, does, it wouldn't work if I said, well, I'm bringing all my friends. As soon as I get a job and I get a chance to give, a, like, give other people 10 jobs, obviously I'm going to look for um, POC, non-cis, non-gender, like anything, uh, people, artists who would want to create with me and then try and get them into the institution so they get good pays and uh, they get a chance to actually showcase their work. Uh, but I cannot say that because if I said it, then it would, the, it would deny the idea. So maybe contextualization or like... And uh, it's always good to have <coughs> networks, yeah. like to know, like to be able to share with other people from in other social contexts and other artistic contexts. Um, that actually gives me, like, it's for my for my heart to know that I'm not crazy. For me, also, like, obviously, my my gas station is um, uh, like being with other people to whom I don't have to explain myself. But that is one part. And I also sometimes like to keep that part in private. Um, but to answer the question, like whom I'd want as an ally, I think I'd want anyone who's big enough to uh, realize that they need to further educate themselves and do so and who are also not telling me that I that my that my expectation is too high or that I'm asking for too much um, while asking for just being treated like this white male director or getting paid in a certain way or accommodated in a certain way or not wanting to take public transport from the airport or like people who don't discuss with me about these kind of things and um, who, um, who go and educate themselves. And then, like, yeah. yeah. You were talking about um, who you are performing for as, as one, one key focal point of w what comes out. And you were bringing Simone as, as an example. Um, I have the experience of, of staging stuff whether it is performance, theater, whatever, since, since 89 in Germany. And I realized that in the first years, like up to, to 95, um, the black community didn't have the capacity to appreciate art as, as a means of change. So the creation of the audience was, was going on in, the, in, in that time. In that time, it was very easy for me to, to function. I was performing on Documenta, I was, I was everywhere. Um, operas, theater, and stuff. And then after, after that, I, I, I staged a, a play called Lost Tribes of Africa, uh, which was a multimedia opera with like 20 black people performing. 
And um, after that, all of a sudden, the white society knew who I was and that I was considering myself black. And from that point on, I couldn't get into anything anymore. And that lasted until, until the 2000s. Um, in the 2000s, I, I realized that I, I first had to change society uh, for both white and black in, in, in order for my art to, to uh, have a fruitile ground, a growing ground or a ground of understanding, of, of reception. And so, so I did stuff outside of, of the artistic arenas like, like organizing black media congresses and, and uh, I, I invented Mea Yim Award, uh, which was a project with UNESCO um, that, that lasted until like, like three, four years ago. And, and that's where, where you, you guys come in. Because now all of a sudden there's, there's, a, there's a, a large population within the community that is, that is really um, up, to, up to the job, <laughs> I'd say. <laughs> uh, to, um, and and, and doing, doing the stuff that needs to be done, not just in the political arena, ESD has been has been doing that for a long time, but but on all other fields, and um, yeah, and this is the point I guess where I hope where hopefully my next bomb will drop. We're we're doing a Black Berlin Biennale now for, since 2012, um, which is neglected, uh, even though Biennale invited us le uh, 2016 and and told us the next time we would be part, but luckily at least now we have a black curator, curatress, and, and um, I just published the Reichstag uh, Kafka in the remix, um, which will be coming out soon. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, contribution. I think this kind of, um, this is a good moment to close unless there's like someone who has a really really urgent question now um thank you so so much i think so many of the no not yet <laughs> so many of the questions that um i have a lot of questions and i know there's a lot that um remains unresolved so i think we should digest that but um we can reconvene with jonathan around the critical uh reflection because what you two touched upon today um here is really part of the larger conversation of this um, platform, uh, particularly the question, I mean, I'm thinking about this question of responsibility that came up, you know, that was also part of, of that. It's a difficult one. Thank you so, so much again, really, for your openness and for your insights and for your brilliance. Thank you. Hmm? Oh, yes. Sorry, Martin. Um, there was two, two things, two housekeeping things. Um, first, if any of you finds a handy, it may be a, a cell phone.